Alright. Little camera problem, but we're on top of it here. <coughs> Okay, so last time I got talking about uh, primary and secondary structure of proteins. I want to continue that today, and I'll pretty much finish up protein structure, at least in general terms, uh, with what I have to say today. So, um, find my pointer here, which is deep in my pocket. There it is. Okay. Um, so last time I finished up by uh, talking um, a little bit about fibrous proteins. And so fibrous proteins, I'll remind you, are proteins that basically have secondary and primary structure. They don't really have much in the way of tertiary structure. When you hear of proteins that have tertiary structure, what we're mostly talking about are, are globular proteins. So globular proteins are by far the most abundant proteins uh, that um, are present in cells, and I'll say a lot more about them. But fibrous proteins don't have that tertiary structure. So since I haven't defined tertiary structure, uh, I need to just say a word about it briefly. Then I'm going to say some more about fibrous proteins and then start talking about tertiary structure. So tertiary structure uh, relates to the folding that's happening at those random coils. So tertiary structure, and I'll give you a definition for it here, um, is uh, it, it arises from interactions between amino acids that are not close in primary sequence. That's the definition for you. Tertiary structure arises from interactions between amino acids that are not close in primary structure, primary sequence, whatever. Okay. Now I'll show you what that means in a figure in a little bit, but I needed to tell you that so that you can understand what's happening with fibrous proteins. Fibrous proteins don't have those bends. Okay. They're fibers. That's why we call them fibrous proteins. That's why your hair has the um, sort of character that your hair has. Okay? Um, you look at uh, uh, fingernails. They're also made of, of uh, a different type, of, a, a modified form of keratin as well. Okay? So fibrous proteins have regular repeating structures, mostly primary and secondary structure, very little tertiary. There's a third type of fibrous protein that um, I haven't uh, talked about. It's a third type of helical structure. And that third type of helical structure, as I said last time, is what arises in collagen. So collagen, I uh, finished up last time pointing out to you that collagen is really unusual. First of all, it has not one, but three helices that are interwound with each other. It's called a triple helix. Okay? It is a helix. It is a set of helices. And the helices have sequences that look like this. Now, the sequences that look like this are uh, interesting, as I noted, because it contains a lot of proline. It contains a modified form of proline called hydroxyproline, which is what those green HYPs are there. And it contains a lot of glycine. Now, as we've sort of talked about before, glycine is very flexible. It allows um, that inflexibility of that proline to be sort of overcompensated for and allows this to form helical type structures. Now, the hydroxyproline is of considerable interest to us from a biochemical perspective because, A, it's an amino acid we haven't seen in proteins. It's not one of the 20 that I gave you. So how does it get into proteins? It turns out it gets into proteins after the collagen has been made. Okay. So many of these sort of unusual amino acids that we see in proteins result from modifications of existing amino acids that are in proteins. How does it get modified? Well, proline gets modified in a very interesting reaction. The interesting reaction involves, not surprisingly, putting on a hydroxyl group onto um, the proline molecule. And the addition of that hydroxyl group actually requires a vitamin. It requires a vitamin. It's one of the only places we know in biology where a, where a vitamin is needed for a chemical reaction. Okay? It's needed as a component of a chemical reaction. The vitamin that's needed here is vitamin C. Okay? Vitamin C. Now, why is this important? Well, collagen, as I said last time, is the most abundant protein that's in your body. It's the glue that literally holds you together. All right? 
It makes your cells stick together. It gives the, the, the um, strength to, uh, cartilage, to cartilage. It gives strength to uh, tendons and things like that. So having strong collagen is important. So how do we get strong collagen? Well, the hydroxyproline is an important component of that strong collagen. It turns out that the hydroxyproline can form chemical reactions with other hydroxyl groups in other chains. Now we've got three chains that are wound together. So if you braid your hair, for example, you know something about braiding and the strength that braiding gives. You make a rope by taking small fibers and braiding them together and braiding them together and you get bigger and bigger things which have considerably more strength. And so what happens in collagen is these fibers are sort of braided with each other and that gives strength, but as you know, if you braid your hair and you don't tie it off with a rubber band, what happens? It comes undone, okay? That's what happens with collagen. If collagen doesn't get chemically modified, if that, those hydroxyl groups don't get put onto proline to make hydroxyproline, there's no rubber band that holds the whole thing together. It turns out that the rubber band are covalent bonds between those hydroxyl groups. All right? Now, so what that means then is that if you have plenty of vitamin C, you have plenty of those bonds between the hydroxyl groups, and the strands are held nice and tight together. They don't come undone, and you don't come undone. If you are vitamin C deficient, which virtually nobody is these days, but if you are vitamin C deficient, then what happens is your collagen comes undone. You develop a condition called scurvy. And scurvy, you literally fall apart. Because your collagen is weak, it doesn't have the support that you need to do things. This, I always like to tell the story, this was originally discovered among the old pirates of old, where they went out on long sea voyages, and the only food that they ate for the most part was salted meat, because that, they didn't have any refrigeration, that's how they kept their stuff. And salted meat doesn't have virtually any vitamin C, so they go out in these great big hulking, stinking masses, and they would come back these small, weak, stinking masses. Okay? That's what happened with pirates. Okay? So, uh, vitamin C is a very, very important component for strength uh, of tissue. It's worth noting that the older you get, the more um, accumulated collagen that you have that is cross-linked, and it's why an old geezer like me isn't nearly as flexible as a bunch of young geezers like you, okay? Because your collagen is younger, it's not quite as cross-linked. At least that's what I like to think anyway. Okay, um, questions about that? White group. Oh, there's a question. Yeah. That's right. So the hydroxyl groups actually split out water and react with each other, and they form a covalent bond. And that covalent bond, I'm calling a rubber band, but it's actually tighter than a rubber band because it's a solid link between them. Exactly. So she said you, have, you basically have to have enough frequency of hydroxylation of the proline in order to have those bonds form. And when you look here, you see hydroxyproline occurs fairly frequently. And so there is abundant hydro hydroxylation that occurs that gives rise to uh, those bonds that stabilize the collagen. Okay? Yeah? I didn't say it influences, it's needed for a chemical reaction. It's one of the only places where the vitamin is, is a necessary component of the chemical reaction. We'll see later that B vitamins play a role in oxidation and energy transfer and things like that, but they're not used in the process. Okay? They're used as coenzymes, they're not used as a chemical component. But vitamin C actually is a chemical component, it's used in this reaction. Okay? Yes, Lori. They are. So it's just holding the braids together. That's basically what it's doing. The more linking, the stronger the collagen is. Okay, yeah, one more, yeah. Vitamin C is consumed in this reaction. It is. So you have to keep eating vitamin C. Vitamin C has other roles. Vitamin C is an antioxidant. We'll say a little bit more about antioxidants later in the term. Um, but in this case, it's actually needed for a chemical reaction. Okay, uh, let's see, where else, what else can I show you? There's um, prolines, glycines, blah, blah, blah. There is um, collagen structure, sort of depicting the three different helices and how they're wound together in the form of a braid. And last but not least, there's 
more of those interactions, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Well, let's turn our attention now to tertiary structure because tertiary structure is really the, the sort of nuts and bolts of protein structure. Primary structure was the sequence of amino acids. It determined all the other properties. The primary structure determines the secondary structure. And primary structure ultimately determines tertiary structure as well. Now, the tertiary structure is, as I said, a folding phenomenon. And when I showed you the structure of ferritin on Monday, you noticed that ferritin had mostly alpha helices, but I pointed out that they were sort of arranged with each other in three-dimensional space. That arrangement of them, the way they get that way, occurs through the phenomenon known as folding. So folding arranges those two-dimensional structures in three-dimensional space. That's what's happening when we're folding a protein. Let's look at myoglobin. Myoglobin's a real good example. Myoglobin is mostly alpha helices. And I keep showing you these proteins that are mostly alpha helices. And in fact, most proteins are mixtures of alpha helix and beta strands. But here's myoglobin. Myoglobin, we're going to talk a lot more about um, next week. And myoglobin is a protein um, that is involved in holding on to and storing oxygen in your muscles. Very important protein for storing oxygen in your muscles. You hear the word globin in there, and you think, is it related to hemoglobin? And the answer is, yes, it is. Okay. We'll see the relationship later. Um, but like hemoglobin, myoglobin has an oxygen binding component. That oxygen binding component is known as a heme group. We don't call this hemoglobin, even though it does have a heme group in it. We call it myoglobin because it was discovered in muscles, and myo refers to muscles. Myoglobin is a real good example of a uh, protein with tertiary structure. As I said, most proteins that exist in cells have tertiary structure. That structure looks very random, but it's not random at all. If I take the same sequence of myoglobin and I make it in this cell, I take another sequence of my, the same sequence of myoglobin and make it in another cell, when they fold, they will have exactly that shape right there. That tells us that folding is not a random process, but it's driven by something. And that something that it's driven by is the sequence of amino acids. Now, I'm going to give you a, a, a sort of a surprising analysis of that uh, in a little bit that I think will give you an idea about the complexity of folding. We don't know a lot of the parameters of folding. We're very, very, very good at predicting portions of a protein that will have an alpha helix. And we're very, very, very good at predicting portions of a protein that'll have beta strands. And we're also very good at recognizing where folds will occur. But putting all of those together into a three-dimensional structure, we're not good at it all. And there's a good likelihood we're never going to be able to completely predict this three-dimensional structure of a protein just from its amino acid sequence. And I'll show you why that's, that's the case in a bit. OK. So, Again, I want to reiterate that we see these regions of random coil, and the regions of random coil are the bends. And those bends are orienting these things in three-dimensional space. Okay. As a result of that, we might say, in fact, when we look at this protein, we see here's one end of the protein here. We can say this is the amino end, and this is the carboxyl. I don't know offhand which one is which looking at it. But let's say this is amino end, and this is carboxyl end. This could be amino acid number one. Whoop. Amino acid number one. Right here, uh, let's say at this coil, we're looking at amino acid number 10. Now, I said secondary structure arises from interactions between amino acids that are less than 10 away. So here's a coil. Here's number 10 interacting with number 17. They're only seven apart. That's a secondary structure. It's a secondary interaction. However, this guy here might also be interacting with this coil that's over here. And this coil might be amino acid number 71, for example. In this case, number 10 is interacting with 71. That's more than 10 amino acids away. That's a tertiary structure. Okay. So tertiary structure arises from interactions between amino acids that are not close in primary sequence. OK. Now, we'll say a lot more about myoglobin. Myoglobin and hemoglobin are fascinating proteins. Um, and, uh, but I won't go into that at this point. When we look at the distribution of amino acids uh, that are present in myoglobin, we see something kind of interesting. The yellow amino acids here um, are, well, that's just not a very good example. 
find it. Let's see if I can find a better one here. Okay. Actually, I don't want to do that. Let me go back. Okay. All right. So here's myoglobin. Now, you, what what they've done with this coloring on this um, uh, structure that you see, and you're seeing a 3D representation of myoglobin, is they've colored the amino acids according to whether they're hydrophilic or whether they're hydrophobic. And what you see is a sort of a general pattern. And it may be a little hard to see in this case, I have to say. But most globular proteins fold themselves in specific ways. And the general rule for the way that most of them fold themselves is that they arrange their hydrophilic amino acids on the outside portion of the protein. Now, that makes very good sense if you think about it, because most proteins are floating around, dissolved in the cytoplasm of the cell, the cytoplasm being an aqueous environment. And so having those hydrophilic amino acids interacting with the water that's out there helps them to be soluble and so forth. That's very good. The hydrophobics, by contrast, don't like to uh, interact with water so much. And we see that they tend, and this is, that's why I didn't like this back side here, they tend to be found on the inside of the protein. And what they do on the inside of the protein is they interact with each other. This is kind of like the old the water and oil thing that I talked about in the first day of class. Oil droplets tend to accumulate and associate with each other because they don't like water. They stay with their own. Water stays with itself. Similarly, the hydrophobic amino acids are associating with each other, and as they associate with each other, they exclude water from the inside portion of the protein. They exclude water. Everybody's happy with this. This actually turns out to be a driving force in folding most proteins. It's called the hydrophobic effect. The hydrophobic effect arises from the preference of hydrophobic amino acids to interact with each other and not with water. That's why most proteins have them on the inside portion of the protein. It's easier to get in there, it's easier to squeeze water out, and everybody's happy. This turns out to be a force that stabilizes the tertiary structure of proteins. A force that stabilizes it. Because they prefer to associate with each other and because they prefer not to have water there, they will hold on to each other and resist being opened up and letting water in. So it's a stabilizing force for tertiary structure. I told you that when we looked at secondary structure, we saw hydro hydrogen bonds were the most important forces. And you might wonder, do hydrogen bonds play a role in stabilizing tertiary structure? The answer is absolutely yes, they do. They absolutely do. There's a third force that is very important for stabilizing tertiary structure that's not so important for secondary structure. And that force turns out to be a new covalent bond. That new covalent bond that we see actually forms between cysteine residues. Remember how I talked about how those SH groups can interact with each other and form a disulfide bond. A disulfide bond is a sulfur-sulfur bond. It's a covalent bond. It's the strongest of the forces that stabilize protein structure. And it provides very good strength in terms of architecture for holding a protein into its configuration. I'll show you some examples later in the period today about how that can do some pretty amazing stuff. Now there's three forces there. You've got hydrogen bonds, you've got hydrophobic bonds, you've got disulfide bonds, there's also ionic bonds. Ionic bonds, you remember, are where we've ionized a portion of the, of the protein. We have a plus charge attracted to a minus charge, for example. That's going to be a pretty good force helping to hold together and stabilize a protein. Now there's a last one, I don't really talk about it in this class, uh, and I don't think it's a, for most proteins, a very strong component, but there's also forces called uh, metallic bonds that can, in fact, also contribute to the stability or the structure of, of tertiary structure. 
I talk a lot about stability. I talk about a lot of forces that hold proteins into three-dimensional structure. And you might think that the three-dimensional structure of a protein is pretty stable. And for some proteins it is, but for most proteins it's not. All those forces together, for example, pretty much for most proteins cannot be stable to something like boiling. Okay? These proteins are stable at the temperature at which you live. So we live at about 37 degrees centigrade. Our proteins are pretty stable at 37 degrees centigrade. You get much above that, your proteins start to denature. You're not going to have problems with that. So, like I said earlier, why we cook food, for example, we kill, we, we denature the proteins in the bacteria, the bacteria die. But there are bacteria, for example, that, that live in environments like in thermal vents where it's extraordinarily hot. And when we look at them, we see their proteins are stable at those higher temperatures. If they weren't, of course, they wouldn't be alive. OK. Uh, now, I've been telling you all about structure. And, and in fact, here is the, um, I'm going to jump ahead one, and I'm going to come back to porin. Here's the formation of a disulfide bond. This is what a disulfide bond looks like. There are two cysteines that are close to each other. When they're close to each other, they oxidize. Notice this is an oxidation reaction moving to the right. You can tell it's an oxidation reaction by virtue of the fact that electrons are lost. Protons are lost as well, making an SS bond. That SS bond is covalent. They said it's a very strong bond. That is a reversible reaction. And we'll see that the cells have the ability to convert disulfide bonds back into sulfhydryls, which is what these are on the left. Cells have the ability to do that conversion using some very interesting molecules that, again, we'll talk about later. I do not like the term cysteine. Don't use it. Okay? It's not really any specific thing. People, you, you, a lot of books talk about it as if, well, you just put two cysteines together and you've got cysteine, but notice it's happening in the context of a protein. So you've got all these other chains hanging around there. So don't use the term cysteine. When we talk about an amino acid, we'll talk about cysteine. When we talk about the disulfide bond, we'll just simply talk about it as that. We won't call it cysteine. I think it's a dumb name. OK. Now, let's talk about an exception to the rule that I gave you about hydrophobic amino acids being on the inside of proteins. I said most. I was very careful when I said the description that I said that most proteins have their hydrophilics on the outside and their hydrophobics on the inside. There are exceptions to that rule. And the exception, one of the exceptions to that rule is a kind of an interesting thing. And it's not that rare of an exception. Okay? Well, you might think, well, why would there be exceptions? Because proteins, our body is, you know, 75% water. These proteins have to exist in this environment. Why aren't all proteins arranged in this way? And the answer is that not all proteins are dissolved in the cytoplasm. Many proteins function and are embedded in membranes. And we'll talk about membrane structure later. I'm sure you've seen it in basic biology. But membranes have what's called a lipid bilayer. And that lipid bilayer has a very hydrophobic component. Here is a protein called porin. It sort of violates that rule that I gave you earlier. First of all, I'll note that porin is a protein that's embedded in the lipid bilayer. So instead of interacting with water on its outside, it's interacting with hydrophobic side chains of the lipid bilayer. We see that the yellow amino acids that are the uh, hydrophobic ones are oriented mostly on the outside. And curiously, on the inside, we see uh, hydrophilic amino acids. Why are they there? Well, it turns out the reason that they're there is because porin has a function. It's not just sitting in the membrane doing nothing. Its function in the membrane is to let water in. And guess where water comes in through? That hole right there. Those hydrophilic amino acids are, in fact, on the inside of this protein, interacting with water. And so we see again that structure is essential for function. The structure has evolved to allow the function that this protein has to have to, to actually occur. The function that's occurring is that we're letting water into the cell through this protein. And the water comes in on a path where there's hydrophilic amino acids. 
if we have hydrophobic amino acids on the inside of this protein, water won't come in. Okay, kind of cool. Question on that? Yeah. White are sort of in between. Yeah. It's called porin, P-O-R-I-N. The protein is called porin. Yes, sir. Well, as I said, it, it, it's a general tendency. So you can see some in here, of course. But in general, the hydroph hydrophobics are on the outside. OK. So let's see. Now, let's talk about another protein. Another interesting protein to talk about, just in terms of general things, is insulin. Insulin is an example of what we call a peptide hormone. Everybody's heard about insulin. Everybody knows that diabetics have issues relating to insulin. And we'll, we'll talk about some of those issues um, later in the term. Okay. Insulin is a protein that has tertiary structure. It also has some interesting components to it. Look at this guy. Now, insulin has disulfide bonds. You can see insulin also has two chains. It has what's called an A chain and what's called a B chain. This tells us that it has two polypeptide chains, and they're held together by disulfide bonds. Okay. Without those disulfide bonds, A won't stay with B. Insulin has no function. and you, uh, you can't uh, uh, handle sugar the way that insulin allows you to handle sugar. Now, a common question I get is, is this what's wrong in diabetes? And the answer is no. Okay. There's other things wrong in diabetes. Insulin is made as a single polypeptide chain. One continuous chain. It folds. And when it folds, the disulfide bonds form. And then a protease comes along and clips it so that the two chain, the, what, what was one chain, become two. Okay. Now, what, the reason I point this out to you, it illustrates, again, the importance of folding. If folding doesn't happen before the protease makes the cut to clip this, then these chains won't, the, the disulfide bonds will not be able to form, and the two chains will not, in fact, be able to be held together. Insulin is also an example of a protein that has a disulfide bond between amino acids. There are only one, one, two, three, four, five, base, uh, five uh, amino acids apart. That's a rare example where you see a disulfide bond in a secondary structure. For the most part, they're not a very big component of secondary structure. One of the things we'll talk about uh, with respect to, to tertiary structures are common features of tertiary structures. So there are common patterns that we run into when we look into different proteins. Yes, question. So the disulfide bonds have to be formed before it's clipped because if it's formed after, they fly apart and they don't have a way to get together. Okay. So. As I said, when we look at proteins with tertiary structure, we see some common features. That is, the common ways in which they fold to make common structures. And we'll talk a little bit about some of these again later in the term. But here's an example of a very common we see called helix, turn, helix. A helix, a turn, and a helix. Notice that this guy's going one direction, we get a turn, and this is going essentially about 90 degrees in the other direction. This structure turns out to be very common, as we shall see. Uh, in certain proteins that bind to nucleic acids. And um, again, I'll say more about those later. What you see in this structure, though, is what we refer to as a common structural feature. And a common structural feature is called a domain. So this is a domain of a protein, a helix turn helix. And we'll say more about domains later. Yeah, back there, question. I'm sorry? I, I use the term domain and motif interchangeably. So thank you for asking that. That's a common question. So technically, they're not the same thing, but I use those, those terms interchangeably, domains and motifs. OK. And there's a protein. I won't say more about that. All right. That concludes what I want to say about tertiary structure. Okay.
So we've zipped our way through now. We've finished three levels of protein structure. We're on our last one now. It's called quaternary structure. And quaternary structure is probably the easiest of the four to understand. You actually have already seen quaternary structure. I just didn't tell you what it was. When you saw insulin, you were looking at quaternary structure because quaternary structure relates to individual polypeptide units interacting with each other. You had an A chain, you had a B chain. I said they were held together by disulfide bonds. That's quaternary structure. It's not one continuous polypeptide chain. Can you hear me okay? Hello. Let's see if I can find a battery to change. See that goes. Okay. Um, so when we have individual chains that interact with each other, what we discover is that we're talking about quaternary structure. Okay. Tertiary structure. We looked at myoglobin. We had one end. It went. It went. It went. It folded. It folded. This thing. We had another end. We have two polypeptide chains interacting with each other. We have quaternary structure. So things that have what we call multiple subunits will, in fact, always have quaternary structure. The difference between hemoglobin and myoglobin is that hemoglobin has four polypeptide chains. Myoglobin only has one. So myoglobin, because it only has one polypeptide chain, does not have quaternary structure does not have quaternary structure. Hemoglobin has four, and those four units interact with each other. And we'll see that interaction is very important. That interaction is the quaternary structure. Now you might say, well, what kind of forces stabilize quaternary structure? And it turns out that what stabilize quaternary structure are the same things that stabilize tertiary structure. You saw how disulfide bonds held the chains together in insulin. Disulfide bonds do that. Hydrogen bonds can help hold them together. Hydrophobic bonds can help hold them together. Quite a wide variety of ways in which they can be held together. Ionic bonds can hold them together. Disulfide bonds are not real common ways of holding chains together. Most proteins don't use disulfide bonds to stabilize quaternary structure. Most of them don't. Here is uh, an example of a protein called CRO. CRO uh, has a very important function in uh, a, ba a bacteriophage known as lambda. Okay? And CRO um, is an example of a protein we call a dimer. It has two identical subunits, one shown in red here and one shown in yellow. They're arranged in almost a mirror image of each other, and that arrangement just like tertiary structure is important for the function of crow. If we disrupt the quaternary structure, we're going to disrupt the function of crow. So forces that help to stabilize quaternary structure are also important because they help to give the protein the appropriate function. Question? CRO. Yeah. Now, when we look at this, we see that crow has the sort of ribbon-like things, those are the beta strands. We see that it has an alpha, it has two alpha, what, three alpha helices uh, on the outside. And this is not, this is not uncommon of a folded protein. And we see that it's got units of beta strand and also alpha helix that are there. In this case, we see that the beta strands are what are doing the interaction between each other and um, giving the protein uh, its overall structure and shape. Yes, question. Uh-huh. The, the same shape as mirror. Yes, yes. I would call it symmetrical. This is symmetrical, yeah, because it's mirrored one on the other. That's exactly what it is. But, but symmetrical refers to the fact that one is reflected in the other. 
So anytime you have symmetry, you have you have planes of symmetry or you have lines of symmetry. This this in this case has a has a it's not right hand, left hand. It's it's not right, it's like having two right hands. That's right. That's right. Okay? It's a good question what he's asking. Is it, is it like right hand, left hand? Because my right hand, there's no way I can put my right hand and my left hand together in the same way. They're different things. Okay? So what you see in Crow is you have the same polypeptide chain, but they're just arranged in a mirrored fashion with each other. Okay? So I could take this hand, this left hand, and superimpose a left hand over here and put them together in, in, in a symmetrical fashion. That's what I would have done. Okay. All right. Um, hemoglobin. I said hemoglobin had quaternary structure. We'll say a lot more about hemoglobin next week. Hemoglobin is um, a protein, as I said, that, is, that has uh, four polypeptide chains. It has two identical units called alpha and two other identical units called beta. So we refer to hemoglobin as an alpha-2, beta-2 protein. Again, we'll say a lot more about that. It turns out that in hemoglobin, the arrangement of these proteins is not only critical for its function, but it gives hemoglobin some very, very interesting and important properties relative to carrying oxygen in the body. I think and I hope to convince you that hemoglobin is one of the most interesting proteins that you will ever see. Okay? Because at the molecular level, what hemoglobin is doing is absolutely remarkable. And the remarkable nature of hemoglobin arises to a large extent from its quaternary structure. We're going to spend a whole day talking about the properties of hemoglobin relative to that. Okay, and last here is an example of a virus. Remember I talked early on about how viruses can self-assemble? This shows the self-assembly of proteins of a virus called a rhinovirus. Many of you are walking around with rhinoviruses right now because they cause common cold. And um, they self-assemble, as I've noted before. And you can see that in, in this case, different proteins, um, or common proteins, are green, red, and uh, blue. But they arrange themselves, as seen here, to make a capsid which is basically uh, a compartment in which to carry uh, their nucleic acid. Very elaborate quaternary structure here. Okay, well, what I want to do now, I've talked about the different levels of sequence. What I want to do now is spend a few minutes talking about examples of that. And one of the examples I always give is a very interesting and unusual protein called ribonuclease. Ribonuclease is an enzyme. And enzymes, you, rec you realize, catalyze reactions. And the reaction that this enzyme catalyzes might seem like why at first if you haven't really studied this stuff before. Ribonuclease breaks down RNA. You say, oh, well, you've got to digest things, so you have to digest it. You uh, break down RNA in your digestive system. But it turns out your cells are loaded with RNAs. It's called RNAs. Ribonuclease is also called RNAs. Right? Your cells are loaded with this stuff. Why do you want to break down your RNA? Well, it turns out breaking down your RNA is important because RNA can code for protein, and you don't always want a protein being made. So being able to break it down after you've made it is a very important consideration. Ribonuclease is something that if you ever have to work with RNA, will drive you crazy. Because it breaks down RNA, and you're wanting to work with RNA, and it's all over your lab material, and you have your nice RNA, and you put it in the test tube, and next thing you know, your RNA has been completely broken down. Damn. OK, well, uh, most enzymes I can take, and I just heat them up, and I stick them in uh, the autoclave, and they get denatured, and there's no enzymes left. But ribonuclease is unfortunately not one of those enzymes you can do that with. This is what makes it an interesting enzyme. And this is why it's an interesting enzyme. This interesting enzyme has amazing thermal stability very, very thermally stable, meaning I can heat it up to a high temperature, and when I cool it back down, it's still active. Most enzymes I can't do that to, for the reasons I've stated before. But what is it that gives ribonuclease these properties? Well, one of the things I hope you recognize that it has, that gives it these properties, is disulfide bonds. Disulfide bonds are helping to hold this together. And you say, well, disulfide bonds are uh, present in most proteins, though, right? So why aren't most proteins like ribonuclease? It turns out in the case of ribonuclease, these disulfide bonds are rather like critical 
building components of a building. Okay? They are present at the most important structural portions of this, of this protein. Just like in a building where you have beams, you can see the beams in this room that are very critical for holding up the ceiling above us. Okay? If I had randomly put beams in here, the ceiling would probably be up there, but it might not be as stable as it is if I really engineer and organize it. Ribonuclease has those beams, that is the disulfide bonds, present in uh, the very critical points. That means that when I take this guy and boil it, bo by the way, boiling a, a, a protein does not destroy its disulfide bonds. It's not strong enough to break covalent bonds. When I boil it, I can see some of these regions that might be interacting coming apart, but because these critical beams are in place, after they come apart, when it cools back down, they just very quickly come back together and remake that functional enzyme. This enzyme is capable of doing something we call refolding. If the beams are erected in the proper places, when you unfold, coming back together is almost the natural thing to do. And that's what this protein does. Now that's pretty cool. Okay. There's other cool things about this protein that are interesting, however. If I take um, a chemical reagent, I can break disulfide bonds. I told you that cells are capable of breaking disulfide bonds. And in the laboratory, we can do this as well. In the laboratory, we can use a chemical called mercaptoethanol. That's the structure of it there. No, you don't need to know the structure. But mercaptoethanol, M-E-R-C-A-P-T-O-E-T-H-A-N-O-L. Mercaptoethanol, just like it sounds. Now, what mercaptoethanol does is it converts disulfide bonds in proteins into sulfhydryls. In the process, mercaptoethanol becomes itself oxidized and makes disulfide bonds. Okay. The net result, though, is that this protein, which had disulfide bonds before, no longer has disulfide bonds. Okay. Yes? This is a, a chemical reagent. It's a chemical reagent, so I'm adding this externally. There are other things that the body does. Okay. Now, if I take, uh, and there are other agents that I can use to disrupt structure inside of proteins. So you see some of them here, urea and guanidinium chloride are used to break hydrogen bonds. And beta mercaptoethanol is uh, obviously the one I just talked about here, breaks disulfide bonds. Let's say, let's say, imagine I take some ribonuclease and I treat it with all of these things and I uh, heat it up. What's going to happen to it? Well, what's going to happen to it was the structures that were holding it together now no longer hold it together. It comes apart. Okay? Do you suppose ribonuclease would be functional in this state right here? I hear somebody say yes because they say he's got to be talking about the opposite of what I think, right? In fact, no. This is not stable. Okay? Denatured enzymes, denatured proteins are not functional. So this guy isn't functional. However, if I start removing those reagents out of this protein, something really interesting happens. I start seeing a little bit of ribonuclease activity returning. Now, with the vast majority of proteins out there, you don't see this. But you do see it with this guy. And the fact that we see it with this guy tells us something very, very, very important. What is it? Well, it's, more, it's bigger than that. So it's not just the importance of ribonuclease, but it tells us something very critically important about protein structure. You probably won't get it. So you want to try? OK, sort of. All right. So what this tells us is that the only information that's there for this guy to refold is the protein sequence. This is confirmation of what I told you at first that you, that you just took on faith from me. And that is that the sequence of amino acids determines all of the other structural components. Because the sequence of amino acids causes this guy, at least some of these guys, to refold. And not, not only to refold, but to fold properly. 
Now, for most proteins, this doesn't work, and I won't go into why that happens here, but trust me that this is one of the few for which it does work. Yes? Okay, so his question is, it refolds, but do the disulfide bonds reform or what? What do you guys think? Do you suppose the disulfide bonds reform? How many say yes? How many say no? The yeses win. You're right. Okay, sometimes the yeses are wrong. But, but in this case, yes, the refolding brings those guys back into close proximity, and they're there. Now, something curious happens with this guy, though. I said we didn't get all of it. We got some of it. Okay? We didn't get all of it. We got some of it back. Why don't we get it all back? Well, it turns out that there's a lot of ways folding can happen. They don't always result in a functional protein. Next time I'm going to tell you about uh, mad cow disease and how it's a disease of misfolding is what happens. Okay? But you do see some of these guys come back together. Now, a very curious thing, I'm going to leave you with a thought puzzle before we do a song today. Oh, there, there you go. All right. All right. The thought puzzle is, if I do this same experiment, but instead of just removing all the mercaptoethanol and all of the um, um, urea. I leave a little bit of mercaptoethanol in there. I get a heck of a lot more functional protein. I want you to think about that, and I'll give you the answer to that next time. Meanwhile, I do have a song about protein structure I'd like to sing with you. It is to the tune of A Little Town of Bethlehem. You've got to sing loud, though. Oh, little protein molecule, you're lovely and serene. With 20 zwitter ions like cysteine and alanine, your secondary structure has pitches and repeats arranged in alpha helices and beta pleated sheets. The Ramachandran plots are predictions made to try to tell the structures you can have for angles phi and psi. And tertiary structure gives polypeptide zing because of magic that occurs in protein folding. Not done yet. A folded enzyme's active and starts to catalyze when activators bind into its allosteric sites. We'll talk about that later. Some other mechanisms control the enzyme rates by regulating synthesis and placement of phosphates. And all the information that's found inside of cells reminds the students learning it a pathway straight from hell. You always should remember the good stuff, not the spam. Amino acid charges will be part of your exam. Okay, thank you. I had a, I had a theory I just had to get out. Okay. About why. Watch, follow me up.